So if you couldn't tell recently, I've been looking into the Paleogene period as the penultimate time period before we hit the end of the year. And it would be rude not to take a look at the biggest terrestrial mammal to ever walk this earth. With the non-avian dinosaurs gone, an evolutionary arms race would soon begin between what remained. Reptiles and avian dinosaurs, i.e. birds, had quite a few good cracks at regaining dominance, but ultimately it was the mammals that established the highest diversity of megafauna throughout the Paleogene. Now a lot of really weird stuff existed at this time. Like, like really weird. As is usually the case after a severe mass extinction in which life gets a little bit experimental as I explained here. Even though these extinct species look weird to us, most of them are still members of groups that are still very much around today, and there's no exception for Paraceratherium. Discoveries of fossils assigned to the group known as the Indricotheres go back as far as 1846, when soldiers found these fossils in modern-day Pakistan. Now, these weren't identified and have become lost to time, so we're unsure whether these were Paraceratherium, but the first official findings were found by a British geologist named Guy Elcock Pilgrim in 1907. These consisted of jaw material and teeth collected from the Chitawata Formation, which were assigned as a species of a Cerotherium, which at this point in time had become a wastebasket taxon. Basically, don't know what it is, but let's slap a label on it. It wasn't until 1910 that Clyde Foster Cooper reassigned this to a new genus and species naming it Paraceratherium bugtiensi. Many more fragmentary specimens were found over the next few years, including many from the famous Mongolian expedition led by the Indiana Jones inspiration, Roy Chapman Andrews. These specimens bounced around many genera and species, including a genus that is often thrown around today in confusion with Paraceratherium, Indricotherium. Now just to clear up, Indricotherium has since been found to be a junior synonym of Paraceratherium, but the term Indricotheres has kind of stuck around as an informal term for the Paraceratheridae. Currently, there are four recognised species of Paraceratherium, the most well-known of which is P. transauralicum, which most reconstructions are based on. Speaking of which, what the hell was this thing? Well, despite looking like the result of a giraffe getting freaky with an elephant, Paraceratherium was actually a member of the superfamily Rhinoceratoidea, meaning that whilst this wasn't a true rhino, it was a sister taxon to them. And it certainly outdid them with bulk. The Paraceratherium size is one that we can't really get exact figures on thanks to incomplete remains, as is the case with a lot of massive animals. But what we do know is that this is likely the biggest terrestrial mammal in Earth's history that we know of so far. This beast is estimated to have been 7.5 to 8 metres or 24.6 to 26.2 feet long with a shoulder height of between 4.8 and 5 metres or 15.7 to 16.4 feet and a weight estimate of anywhere between 11 to 20 tonnes. In fact, the neck alone could have been up to 2.5 metres or 8.2 feet long. Below that neck, Paraceratherium would have looked more or less like a very lanky rhino with thick folded skin, very little body hair, and rhino-like hooves. The neck, as already stated, was also excessively long, with a strange-looking skull in which the premaxilla dipped downwards heavily with two far separated incisors at the front of the mouth. Some paleontologists have even suggested that Paraceratherium had large elephant-like ears in order to help with thermoregulation in a similar way, since massive animals like this find it more difficult to shed heat, but there's been plenty of scepticism to this idea. So where was this thing stomping around? Well, the genus of Paraceratherium was flung far and wide throughout the Oligocene, with specimens being found all across Asia and Europe, occupying arid deserts, shrubland and subtropical forests. Obviously, this means that the animals co-inhabiting ranged greatly as well, with various large cats, false saber-toothed cats, packs of bear dogs and hyena dunts, as well as other rhinoceratoids and various artiodactyls, or the even-toed undulates. With this in mind, along with the very long legs of this animal, it's very likely that they covered quite a bit of distance and were migratory, travelling to various biomes in which they could feed on the high ground vegetation. The specific type of vegetation would have been mostly soft leaves, of which they had to eat high volumes of due to the low nutritional value. Those incisors would have come in handy here too, one kind of animal with similar front teeth are tapirs, 
which use those front teeth to strip bark, which Paracerotherium might have done along with just flat out breaking twigs and branches. On top of this, they may have actually played some sort of role in intraspecific combat. Sexual dimorphism has been proposed with Paracerotherium, mainly when it comes to those incisors, since some specimens show much bigger ones. Now when we see sexual dimorphism on a trait that could potentially be used as a weapon, it often implies that two members of the same species would have the odd fight, normally for either mating rights or territory. These were herding animals, but remember, even bull elephants will fight each other often, using the same tusks that they use to help with foraging and feeding. So it's very much possible that that was the same for this giraffe elephant that's actually a rhino thing. As for why it's not around today? Well, quite a few theories have been thrown around, but Paracerotherium happened to go extinct right at the end of the Paleogene, when the entire world began to see major faunal turnover as it went into the Neogene period. But no spoilers, because I've got quite a bit to get through for the Paleogene period still, so I guess you'll have to find out about that next time.